about um, this group show. Um, I it's something that I had been um, imagining for a number of years, um, and um, and had the opportunity to uh, execute along with my my show here, which um, I knew it was going to be a lot of work, but I don't think I understood how much. Um, doing uh, both things together was going to be, and um, also I will say, just to plug, um, I am uh, also do, uh, publishing on the occasion of these two shows a small catalog that um, encompasses both shows and also a fantastic conversation between myself and the brilliant Sue Taylor. Um, and there will be a, a small informal catalog release on the 30th. Is last that Saturday of the, the last show. Saturday of the show, so it'll be sort of a closing um, catalog release in the early afternoon. Look for info about that um, if you're interested. Please join us. Um, so uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to curate this work, and um, nine artists, um, seven of them based in New York. Um, one of them based in Chicago and one of them based here in Portland. And, um, you know, I was thinking about, I was thinking, of, the title is Drinking the Reflection. I was thinking about influence, about um, people whose work I think about in my own studio practice, but also about, um, and you can see in many of the works, if you've had a chance to walk through the exhibition, there is there are through lines of doubling or reflection, um, and also a kind of um, you know otherworldliness or superworldliness, a, a kind of dreamscape um, in which such strange things uh, like drinking a reflection may happen. Although that that um, that is impossible. We know you can't actually drink a reflection because once you go to interact with it, then the thing itself changes, right? And a reflection is is not a stable. Um, object. So, um, yeah, those were some of my thoughts um, in pulling this work together. And also, um, we're just wanting to bring in um, uh, artists that may, that um, my communities here, the, the community of Portland, may not have been um, exposed to and share some work that I think is, is really um, fantastic. Um, and at that, I'm going to turn it over to Mira so you can talk about your fantastic work. Okay. I mean, most of my work is in so here. You can should you go over? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So, I will start off by briefly sharing a version of the Lilith myth, as I understand it. Um, There is an older story of Adam and Eve where God created Lilith out of the dust that he created Adam out of. Um, and Lilith was made to be Adam's companion, but refused to lay beneath him. Um, and in doing so, she fled the Garden of Eden. Um, which made Adam cry uh, <laughs> and lament and um, whine to God about it. And so God sent his angels to find Lilith. And when the angels found Lilith, she was laying with demons um, and giving birth to hundreds of demon babies <laughs> daily, um, which the <laughs> angels were like, what? what is happening here? You can't do this. You have to come back with us. And she refused. She was like, no, to hell with this. I, I won't. I refuse to do this. I, I'm not going to be lesser than. I'm, I'm equal here. Um, and God offered her an ultimatum that if she refused to come, he would kill 100 of her children every day. Um, and she vowed revenge um, by swearing to haunt and attack the children of Adam and Eve. Um, so Lilith has been blamed since way back for the deaths of children and the waywardness of children as well. Um, there's an old story that if your child is 
laughing or smiling in its sleep, you place one finger in front of its lips, and that'll keep Lilith from, you know, possessing or harming the child. And so in making this carving, which is a replica of my finger, I was envisioning Lilith making the same gesture in futility to her own children. Um, and that's sort of where it began. Um, this is also the finger I use to every morning scroll my phone, right? I'm looking at the headlines. I'm looking at, you know, this triggering information, images. I'm looking through both of my Instagrams. Um, I'm looking through, you know, like collecting imagery for art. And all of this is washing over me. I had a conversation with two of my friends a while ago where I, I swore to them that these two different people that we know were the same person. They're not. And this, this happens to me, like I'll see people and I'll think like, I know this face, I know this face, and it's because I can't recognize people's faces very well. So to try and explain that phenomenon, I overlaid both of their faces with an opacity filter to try and show how they were the same one. <laughs> And apparently that's just me. <laughs> um, so I started doing that with images that I'm collecting um, from my, my daily exposés into the, uh, into the internet. Um, and finding images that relate to each other in particular ways. And just in immediacy, laying them one on top of another and trying to unite them in some specific way. Um, so each of these images is an iteration of that kind of process. Um, I do all this work on my phone, this particular body of work, because that has a scale and relationship that directly mimics how I encounter these images and um, allows me to like work with them in the same space. Um, and so, like, this first one, this is Vitae, um, which is named because some of the stone carving um, uh, watermarks are still on the images that I've taken. Um, this is, like, composed of busts found in, like, marble yards in Italy that are, like, new versions of old statuary. Um, and it's combined with images of false breasts, like false silicone breasts on um, similarly sized like torso stands, um, which coming to me from my Amazon feed that they're, you know, my suggested purchase for the day. Because um, Bezos knows what I want. Um, <laughs> and so I'll bring these back and forth, I'll play with the colors, I'll try and like create something sympathetic, like those, those strange like silicone figures feel sad and like specific to my experience, but like not really, but I want to like feel something better for them than their existence in that format, and so I try to make them more classical, like bring them this sort of like figurative association that's not just as an accessory. Um, and this process kind of does lend itself to me feeling like sympathy or like sadness towards objects and like um, materials that I find in this endless scroll. It's like very emotionally laden intake of information. Um, yeah, that's, there's specific like collection stories for each of these, but I don't know that I want to get really directly into all of those. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. <laughs> Can you talk about the styrofoam carving? Because that's something that I think we all saw that one, maybe not connecting it as you walked in. This yeah. Awesome. So, um, the styrofoam pieces, 
I mean, that kind of arose because I'm, I am more classically trained in carving and I'm trying to like find materials that I could work really quickly and viscerally in this like subtractive method and approach, you know, forms that still speak to me and that won't, you know, just crumble to pieces. Um, and styrofoam is this like eternal object, right? You can't get rid of it. You can melt it, but it turns into styrene gas, which is this whole other problem. Um, and so I started to think about it as this, uh, this kind of archival material. Um, that piece in particular, to me, is about um, compartmentalization, um, splitting, you know, a, a further segmentation of the body from like torso to half torso. We get an internal view of that, that particular body. Um, that piece is, you know, I think about balance, like there's the spike that's holding it taut against its own gravity, um, which is also kind of like a threat. Like if it, it almost seems as though it's slingshotting back to attack the body. Um, there's something about disposability of material, but also its permanence, which feels really relatable to me. Um, Maybe for the fragility, like I feel like, you know, like styrofoam is so, like it right. breaks. It's, and... it's fragile, but its components are mm -hmm. indestructible. Mm -hmm. so there's something there as well. Do you like? Or do you enjoy like the ancient process combined with like the super modern? <coughs> like I just, I really like that. that like it's a really old. Like you're carving, and then you have like cell phone images. Like is that? Are you like doing both at the same in the same day? Or are you like trying to? I I will do both in the same day sometimes. I mean, like, it's the same bodies that are doing both things. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm not even sure that it's an old... It is an old process, but I think finding images is as old as we are. So, mm -hmm. like, this is just a different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I mean, there's some ways in which... This isn't a traditional way of doing stone carving, right? Usually they would have the rest of it and then maybe lose a finger. Mm -hmm. um, but this is being really selective about what part of the body I'm showing. So I think it is kind of a more postmodern approach to it. It's like extreme segmentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.